All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. Hope everyone is doing uh, well today. Uh, today, uh, we have a fun session uh, in front of us. Our friend Dave Snowden is uh, returning to the Stoa. And uh, Dave is, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's a management consultant. And I would also say a, a philosopher. Um, he works at uh, Cognitive Edge, um, a management consulting firm. Uh, someone's unmuting themselves. Uh, uh, management uh, consulting uh, firm that specializes in complexity and test making. Okay, I'm gonna. Someone's unmuting themselves, so uh, I'm gonna take away that feature for a moment. Um, he also developed the Kinevin framework, uh, which is probably the thing I recommend uh, most uh, people wanting to uh, navigate, better navigate the complex and confusing world that we're in. Uh, and Dave was a previous uh, philosopher in residence here at the STOA, and he's returning to share his thoughts on metamodernism. Uh, some of the questions that Dave sent me uh, that we put in the blurb, is there any real magic in metamodernism? Is it a distraction and a dangerous for, uh, one from genuine engagement with change? Is it a sophisticated form of gaslighting in an age that requires material engagement with reality? Are links with adult development triggering a form of closet eugenics? Oof. So there's no uh, shortage of uh, juicy questions we have today. And how today is going to work, Dave's going to share his thoughts. And uh, I might have some questions, and we'll pivot to Q&A. So if you have any questions, pop it in the chat. I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself, ask Dave your question. I won't be going in any particular order, and we probably won't get to everyone, because I imagine we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, so if you can keep your question concise. And uh, so I'm monologuing one follow-up. Um, and this will be on YouTube. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that, and I will read your question on your behalf. And we're here for about 90 minutes in total. So that being said, Dave, welcome back to the STOA. And uh, I'm taking you in. And the STOA is yours. Oh, and you're on mute right now. Dave, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, always a pleasure to be with you guys. And, and thank you for finally agreeing to my title. Uh, Peter and I had a bit of a debate on this, yeah. And my fundamental argument that, you know, given that metamodernism is meant to be about irony, um, I was allowed to have the title, and if people didn't understand it, they weren't really entitled to come to the conversation, right? Um, so the metamodernism, is, I think I'm quite pleased with it, to be honest. Um, the trouble is, I, I should say now I've suffered for it. I have had to read so much stuff I never want to read again, and watch so many YouTube views, which I think are deeply corrupting. Along with some good stuff as well, I had a really good session with Lena in Lena in um, Copenhagen this week. Big conversation, and she's doing some work with us in April for people who are interested um, on the future of education. So it's been good and bad, right, in that sense. But having to watch um, Peterson um, associating himself with metamodernism is a deeply depressing experience. And I think several people have actually condemned Vivaki for not actually calling him out, but just going along with the fame. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of that on it. So basically what I want to do is to start by kind of like coming from where I first got into metamodernism, which was actually around Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, I'll come on to that in a minute, which I discovered late in life you know, during COVID. That was a late discovery and that's been useful. Um, go through what I think are three of the ways in which a, a concept from aesthetics is being misused. And I'm going to take that general line that as a concept in aesthetics, it's actually quite useful uh, because it allows us to describe things, which it like, gives us an analytical framework to understand things which artists are doing, but they wouldn't actually apply that label. And that's you know, my big, one of my one of the major areas I studied at university was aesthetics. So aesthetics and ethics were where I was really interested in philosophy. So I can see the value in that context. Um, and then I want to come back and really sort of pick up on the sort of famous where the light gets in concept from Leonard Cohen. Um, and, and I'm going to argue an Occam's razor, to be honest, which is fundamentally for the areas where metamodernism is applied, we don't need it. And it's not the right way of going about the subject which doesn't mean a lot of the aspirations people have, which, are co which come under that label, are not valid aspirations and not ones we should look at. And so for those of you who know, I'm probably closer to new materialism um, than to metamodernism. 
So if you want an alternative to postmodernism, I think actually new materialism is much more effective, although I don't agree with all of it, and I'll bring some of that in towards the end. So that's the plan. Yeah. Um, I'll also keep an eye on, on the chat, like, chat area as, as we go through this. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. yeah, don't get me on to Peterson. I still am recovering from that. I'd avoided listening to too much, and I've now had to go through five hours of him as part of this project, all right? And that's more than enough for anybody. I, I feel corrupt just through the process. Um, okay, so as I say, I come back to where I started on this. Um, one of the key, key ways that um, I got into this was when I started to read some academic essays on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, because the great thing about Buffy, sorry, and I'm a total convert to Buffy, especially the... The, the episode with the music demons, which I think is just so, so delightful. I can watch that as many times as I need to. Um, is that, you know, the great irony in it is that the beautiful young girl is beating up the monsters. And that's a delightful juxtaposition, all right? And there's been a whole body of essays, which I got into it, read on that. And that was when the meta-modern phrase started to come in, you know, in, in terms of the way. Um, and that doesn't go, go back as far as 1975. I think that's, I came at it, COVID, most of the literature really comes in in, in 2000, um, 2000 plus. And I think if you look at it, modernism, postmodernism, and now metamodernism are ways in which effectively analysts or academics describe broad movements in art. So the art doesn't come from modernism or postmodernism, it's a way of describing what the art meant. And I was in Louisiana um, two days ago. Uh, we ran a big project on leadership, which actually went really well. Um, but to be honest, the reason I was in Copenhagen is Louisiana has got an exhibition on, on art of the Weimar Republic, uh, which I find fascinating, largely because we're going through a complete replication of it in current times. Um, and so we organize a, an event to sort of justify my going there. But if you look at the sort of Bauhaus exhibition, if you look at the art of, of Weimar, you can see how modernism becomes a way of describing that art. Yeah? And then the rejection in the 80s, the introduction of relativism, social constructivism, et cetera, you can see that with postmodernism. Now, there's an interesting parallel here because a lot of the, the metamodernists are engaged in a rejection of postmodernism. Um, I find that rather ironic, actually, because the word meta in this context comes from the Greek, and I'm going to be careful here because Anna's on the call, but she can correct me, um, which actually means between something, um, whereas it gets reinterpreted by a lot of people to mean transcend, and, and a rather crude rereading of Hegel's dialectics, if I may say so in some cases, right? So the basic concept is it should be between modernism and postmodernism, it should use the best of both, it shouldn't reject it. And if you look at Lena's work, she goes on beyond that to say it's not just modernism and postmodernism, it's indigenous, it's all these different periods that we need to bring the best of all of them and avoid the worst. Yeah. Um, so there is a parallel, I think, with what actually happened in the 1940s, for those of people who don't know it, when four women went up to Oxford to study philosophy. Um, and there were no men there, so they, they all became great. Um, yeah, Elizabeth Anscombe, Mary Midgley, who I knew well, um, Una MacDonald, I think, was one of them, and um, Iris Murdoch, obviously. Uh, there's been a book published right, recently about those four when they went to Oxford. And they were heavily driven in attacking a then do dominant philosophy, which I hated as well, which was called logical positivism. And if you want an ironic criticism of that, go and watch Tom Starpart's Jumpers, which takes the total piss of a hold of logical positivism in an absolutely delightful way. The logical positivists are portrayed as acrobats, yeah, um, which is wonderfully satirical. Um, and basically, they were facing the horror of the Second World War. And they said, we have to find a way in which we can say that some things are right and some things are wrong. Um, and I still remember when I went to university, which was still stuck in this, all right, I wasn't allowed to talk about Tolstoy's what is art in terms of what is beauty. I was only allowed to talk about what a critic means when they say that something is beautiful. And we had the same problem in ethics. It was that over-focus on language yeah, in terms of the way it worked. 
So I think we see a similar rejection, and I think we should note that. So the horror of the Second World War produces a reaction against logical positivism, an attempt to create a theory that we must be able to say that some things are right or wrong. And in face of the current poly crisis, and I come to crisis of meaning in a minute, which so I'll get controversial, to be honest, I think the whole crisis of meaning is an attempt to gaslight us into accepting a new religion, right? Um, but fundamentally, the, the sort of poly crisis that we face, I think poly crisis is a better phrase than meta crisis. Yeah, in fact, it's, I, I think meta crisis is the wrong phase. We face multiple simultaneously crises. Is sort of postmodernism, an acceptance of all different points of view, all of that sort of stuff is just not feasible for anybody who cares about the modern world. So I want to make that strict parallel because I think the reaction to something sort of influences the way we see it. Um, and I would say that I actually think um, Seth Abraham's stuff on postmodernism, that's where I've actually really got value. But then he's actually a literary critic, so he's coming at it entirely from that perspective. And he avoids the jump into politics and history and religion. Yeah, or at least in the stuff I've read so far. So that that for me has been useful. And I'd just like to acknowledge that I've picked up a lot of ideas from him in going through this. So let's look at, at three separate th ways in which metamodernism, to my mind, goes off the rails. Um, and I'm going to do them in degrees of degrees of derailment, if you want to put it that way. All right. So I think that the first one. It's kind of like we're juddering and we might go off, but we could correct it. And the other one, we're off the rail and the other one, we're causing a train wreck. So the, the, the metaphor could get too extensive here, but that's where I'm coming from. So one is the whole use of it in history, which is what Lena does, right? So it's an, her book on metamodernism is effectively a plea for us to actually see the world and perceive the world in a different way and avoid the conflict between modernism and postmodernism and integrate things from many different fields. And I've said this to her face, so this is not a repeat, and I know she's going to watch the recording. Um, so we had a great conversation over coffee. I don't buy the crude separation of history into stages, and I can see why she does that, because she's trying to get a point across. Um, but I don't think there's a progression between those history stages, and I don't think anything is quite that separate anyway. Yeah, a lot of modern stuff is starting to challenge the whole concept of we went from hunter-gatherer to agricultural. It looks like we actually fuse the two and use them in different ways, for example. So that sort of enlightenment understanding of history, I think, is problematical. But I can buy that. I uh, don't have a particular problem. The issue with me with that is when it moves on to the whole, and, and this is where we get goats, and I've forgotten who the other guy wrote within their false ID, is where they start to link um, metamodernism, not just with stage theory, but with Wilbur and the whole spiral dynamics, Jade, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah, Heinz for Hansi Fred. Yeah, that's the that's the combined name. Um, and I sort of sat through, if you haven't seen it, the Nora Bateson session, um, which was mediated by Brendan. And I'll come back to Brendan later, because he's another one who I think is sort of well intentioned, but yeah, in proper problem areas, right? Um, if you look at the debate with with Nora, and I love the way Nora attacked stage theory because it made me, it allowed me to be the reasonable one. Normally, I'm I'm the attack dog, but in this case, I'm slightly more reasonable than she was. She says it's modern eugenics. Um, I'm a sort of increasingly um, starting to believe that she was probably right, but I'm not quite there yet, right? Um, but what we see is that and it, it's also mixed in with this rather weird form of sort of German, Swiss, Nordic nationalism, which actually has bad precedents in human history. I'll come back to the Weimar Republic. And what we now start to see is that um, it's it's seen as the yellow value means. So the adoption of metamodernism is to adopt a higher level of enlightenment. If you understand metamodernism, you are at this enlightened stage, you've moved up a level. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of the attacks on Nora, she's attacked extensively um, for being yellow, right? I mean, I actually picked an extract for this to point it, all right? So after that thing, um, D, 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 yeah, somebody basically says, 
Nora wanted to disprove stage theory, but she's actually confirmed it. She's creating her own stage theory. Well, okay, that's fine. But then it goes on to basically say Nora is expressing turquoise holistic views while not recognizing the stages she went through to get there. And then somebody comes in where she's not turquoise at all. She's an obviously sort of green, seeing everything through green glasses. Yeah. So you're, you're getting into this sort of, I'm putting you into these little boxes and kind of like it's almost like the Spanish Inquisition, which we probably should expect rather than not expecting. In that, you know, now if you haven't reached this stage of enlightenment, you're at a lower level of heresy. And I still remember that from when I went to a conference with um, Beck and John from Arlington Institute and got told I could, couldn't understand them because I hadn't acquired turquoise understanding and I was just an angry blue. And I still remember that night having badges made, which said proud to be brown and, and getting everybody to wear them in the conference the next day. Then I discovered that there was no sense of humor or irony because I got told I obviously didn't understand spiral dynamics because brown wasn't a spiral dynamics color. And that was the whole bloody point in the first place. But, you know, never mind. Right. Don't, don't use irony in those contexts. So as I, say, I think that then gets actually quite dangerous. Um, and the attempt to assimilate what Nora was saying and warm data into that, I think, is really worrying. No, no, and I'll come back to this later, but I'll just hint at this. One of the key phrases Nora makes in that interview is that we don't know the boundaries of the deer. She's making the point that you can't see things in isolation from their environment and interaction. So hold that one because I want to come back to that, because it seems to me that metamodernism in this manifestation um is an absolute extension yeah of extreme social atomism the focus on the individual individual perception but i'm going to come back to that that, that in a minute and therein lie many dangers for society um the other thing by the way if you watch it is is goats is continuously mansplaining nora in order to try and get her to say what he wants her to say it's quite appalling actually i think i'm going to use it as a textbook case um, if you look at it. So I, I'd recommend having a look at that. Yeah. So I think that's kind of like the first one, which I think is deeply problematic, is making metamodernism into a state of enlightenment. And anybody who hasn't understood those sort of things is therefore in a problematic area because they haven't reached that level. Yeah. And as people know, my general view of stage theories is they're fundamentally flawed and potentially actually quite evil. Um, are prepared, I mean, even Kagan, you can take Keegan at the respectable end. Um, and we're actually doing work with some of Keegan's ideas, but we're breaking them down to a low level of granularity and seeing them as modulators within a complex system relating to human behavior, but not seeing them as a linear series of progressions. I know, I'm going to come back to that several times. That's a really important point. You can take the insights of a lot of the stage theory people and say they've identified characteristics of humans which are useful, but those characteristics aren't acquired in a linear way. And the metaphor with childhood development has always been flawed because children go through radical physical differences until round about their early 20s, yeah, and particularly around puberty. But you can't go from that concept, which we know about scientifically, to assume the same thing happens cognitively for adults. You know, when adults are adults, they're adults, and the context actually starts to matter a lot more. So, as I say, my, my issue with stage theory is if we regard aspects of that, and we need to break that, they're at two coarsely grained levels from a complexity point of view. So you, you, you can't say there are five stages and only X percent of the population will reach stage two and so on. I mean, that's just crap, right? But you can basically say all of those things which we describe, some of them actually are path dependent. So some of them require you to have certain experiences. Right? This is me changing the granularity and changing the concept of path dependency to say we can look at those in a more phrase I invented a long time ago, which other people have copied, which is messy coherence. So rather than seeing them as a linear set of stages, that's far too neat and tidy. They're actually messily coherent. There are multiple aspects of this. In different contexts, they'll actually have different application in different relative strengths. And we're sort of linking that into to, to other material. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's fine. I sh should not get distracted by the side. All right. But um, we, can, we can find the links later. So that's one. 
Now, the second one is when then we move on to game B and the misappropriation of the term sense making, which is a major concern for me at the moment. Now, I want to say very clearly here, I remember talking about game B with Jordan Hall when he had the first idea when we were together on Powder Mountain. Yeah, I was staying with Dan for the following week, you know, yeah, and along with Forrest and those guys. So I know those three and they're, they're great people. And Dan's original, sorry, um, Jordan's original idea was to create an environment in which people could explore new forms of reality, yeah, in terms of the way things work. Um, and that was, I was quite excited about, we talked about it, but then you come on to game B and now it's no longer an exploration of a new reality, it's the imposition, somewhat ironically, of a grand narrative of the future onto people. And given that metamodernism is meant to be the rejection of postmodernism's grand narrative, it's rather odd that we have game B as a future vision and game A as the sort of past. And that seems to me hypocritical at best. Not only that, and I sat through the game B stuff when you ran it, Peter, to be honest, all right? And I thought Tyson was very polite. I remember chatting about this with Tyson in Australia afterwards, all right? And um, if you haven't seen it, there's a whole series of videos that Beth and I did, Welsh Meet Indigenous Australia with Tyson, um, which we can give you the links on and where some of this was explored. Game B is a massive cultural appropriation of, of Indigenous images without permission. You know, the concept that we've all got some evil beast on our back holding us back and then we can be taken to the next stage of enlightenment if we're freed from it by a mystical intervention. I mean, all of that stuff is actually, as I say, quite dangerous in terms of the way it works. It's also, from my mind, and I'm going to be very clear on this, um, I think game B is a type of lotus eating. Um, I'm not sure about this one specifically, but there's a lot of evidence that far-right libertarian money is going into New Age approaches. Because if you move into that sort of New Age type approach, then you don't engage with reality. You sort of sit contemplating how things should be. And from a far right point of view, that's good because it takes activists out of the network and to somewhere else. And one of the other major criticisms of metamodernism, certainly from Marxists, and, and that's modern Marxists, is it has no ability to account for how we change the world because it focuses on how we think about the world, not about how we change the world. Um, Nora and I, and Lena as well, actually, we're completely on board on this, have also heavily criticized the whole in internal development goals concept as a major distraction because it's trying to say that we can handle climate change just by all getting into a nice you know northern european north american huddle and talking about how we would like the world to be and how we need to change ourselves individually to create some magical transformation and that's not engaging with material reality in any way whatsoever so for me, the game B thing is problematic. Um, linked with that is the mis misappropriation of the word sense making. Uh, we've seen that with Rebel Wisdom. We've seen it with Grey Swan Guild. Both of them have grabbed onto the term. Both of them have published material and set up training courses on it. Neither of them acknowledge any of the five major schools of sense making. They're just using the label to apply to something that they believe in ideology, in, in, ideologically. And I'd say that's what's happening to metamodernism as well. It's just an attractive name. So people are tagging it on regardless. So that's the second one where, where I've got significant concerns. Yeah? And I've had a lot of arguments um, with Jeff, for example, when I, when I work with Jeff with Starlight Runner on counter narco work in Mexico and elsewhere. And there's always been a debate between us on my point of view is we, we shouldn't be trying to create a narrative. That's what, what film people do and what's what um, the whole issue about the environments around the films, which people like Style Run are involved in, the consistency of the games, is to make sure that you join the universe which has been designed by the designers of, the, of that universe. Whereas where we were focused entirely differently, we were focused on gathering mass micro-narratives across populations identifying where people were and starting to see how we could shift them into adjacent possibles. This is what I've famously called the Frozen 2 strategy, uh, which is a reference to the wonderful song in, in Frozen 2, where the real heroine of the movie sings, all I can do is do the next right thing. Uh, and in complexity, going back to Kaufman, that's called the adjacent possible. 
So, and, and I want to emphasize that, that was a major difference between Jeff and myself when we were working. It's a difference between myself and Gambino. Instead of mapping where people are and allowing them the epistemic sovereignty to define their own position, and from that to identify sustainable pathways to a different future, what Game B is trying to do, and what a lot of the metamodernism appropriation is trying to do, is to define what that future should be from a particular ideological perspective. Right? And that's one of my substantive objections to it, which is not to challenge the intent of some of them, which then moves me on to the next one, which is the whole religious thing. Right? I've noticed something about metamodernism. It seems to attract lots of theologians. So there's obviously some sort of existential crisis in theology at the moment that they're all trying to find something to do, but they don't want to be involved in traditional religions. So you can see that metamodernism is quite attractive. Yeah? Now, Vavaki is probably one of the main guys on this. If you look at religion without a religion, and again, I've got some respect for what Jordan is doing on that, but very little um, respect for Vavaki. I shall call it out up front, all right? I intensely dislike Neoplatonism. I think it in inevitably leads to the concept that some people are enlightened and, can, and are not confined to the shadows on the cave wall. And it's always produced Manichaean approaches if you look at the history from you know, Paul through Augustine and so on in terms of the way it works. And I also dislike stoicism because I think it's the way power gets people to accept power and not complain too much. So kind of like two of Vavaki's main um, planks, I disagree with anyway. Right? Um, and also I got really depressed because his failure to condemn Peterson is a real issue. And if you watch the videos of the two together, it's like this terrible bromance. Yeah in which they're validating each other. And I will make a general comment about Verbach. I think he falls into that category. I mean, his undergraduate degree is cognitive psychology. I don't think that makes him a cognitive scientist. I mean, I, I grant you he's got, a, he's got application in that. He knows some of the field, but I think we need to be cautious about our claims. I think there's a little bit of um, Sheldrake in Vivaki. Yeah, the, the whole concept of morphic resonance, which is a pseudoscience, but everybody wants to keep telling you that Sheldrake is a scientist because it sort of validates the pseudoscientific aspect. So I think there's a little bit of that going on, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, so I have a real problem with that. Um, and also, I think what he's the, the whole concept of a crisis of meaning, I just don't buy. Right. Um, this is a middle class intellectual problem. The problem people have in the world which isn't just poor people anymore. I mean, we, we've switched our agar off. Sorry, this is middle-class England. We can't afford to run our agar full-time anymore because of electricity prices. Now, this is a major crisis in, in middle-class England, all right? Um, but generally, people can't afford fuel. They're having to choose between eating and, and heating the house. We've got a major European war. I mean, when, when I was in my 70s, yeah, yeah, um, Sorry, when I was in, in the 70s, I didn't expect in my 70s for there to be a major European war going on, but there is, right? And none of these are related with a crisis of meaning. They're created with a series of material crises that we need to address, yeah? It's not this sort of intellectual masturbation of a crisis of meaning, yeah? And every time I look at that, it looks to me like a form of gaslighting. You, you have to accept the crisis of meaning. And then, of course, you'll fall into the sort of new religion or whatever. Now, as some of you will know, I've heavily criticized Brendan on this because his latest video on religion, except Brendan is really well intentioned, by the way, he's a nice guy. But he starts off by start, the first start of the video says that 80 percent of the British population um, accept that there is no meaning in the life. So I thought I kind of like challenged that a little bit. So I asked where it came from. And I first of all got told where he picked it up from Vavaki. So I said, well, that's fine. Vavaki said it. What's Vavaki's source? And then we got given the Sun newspaper. Now, if anybody knows the Sun newspaper, this is not generally regarded as an authoritative source, right? And it turns out that this 80% figure comes from a survey run by a company, yeah, in 2019, I think, which manufactures probiotics and was part of a, man, a, a marketing campaign to get people to buy probiotics so they would feel better, yeah? Now, 
and this is a criticism, you know, Brendan now realizes that, but he hasn't taken it down or apologized for that. Yeah, it's a factual error. I then got told, given other data in support of it, which didn't support it in any way whatsoever. This desire to, to tell a story and to disconnect from the facts is dangerous and it needs to be called out. So I'm partly doing that at the moment. Don't do, disagree with some of the motives, but to create a crisis of meaning, I say, I think that's gaslighting. It's designed to get us into a position where we'll accept whatever is offered at, as an alternative, and I'm happy to defend that. Somebody else, um, I can't remember who now, I'll look it up, basically said the application of metamodernism to religion is a, dis is a distinctly Protestant project. And I thought about that and thought, actually, that's true. Um, because it focuses on the individual, individual attitudes, individual salvation, individual relationship with God, etc. So you could see it as a crisis within that. And I say I've already mentioned internal development goals and so on. Now, I'm coming from a very different perspective on that, as many of you know, is that we need to see human beings. And this is Nora's point about where is the edge of the deer, that we're fundamentally engaged we're defined by our communities and we are also defined and this is the work i was working on with tyson we kind of like need a peace and reconciliation process with the planet because we're defined by our physical environment as well as our social environment and we're not isolated individuals who make choices we're part of that environment and for those of you who are familiar with the new materialism and particularly delanda who picks up on deleuze and assemblage theory Fundamentally, the sort of social environment of our narratives largely determines how we see the world anyway. Um, I've challenged recently the whole concept of mindset and mental models and suggest, which is a very cognitive framing, and said that what we should think about instead is agency, assemblage and affordance. Because if we look at those three, there's way you know we can look at how we change them in order to create a sort of better space. So. That's really bringing in me into this sort of Occam's razor. Yeah? And it's also links with the Leonard Cohen thing from Anthem. And some of you will know that there's a major festival in the UK every year. If you haven't been to it, come. It's, on, it's in May this year called How the Light Gets In. So it's a four day festival of philosophy and music. And it's nothing but philosophers and scientists in multiple debates. I get a lot of my ideas there. It's just a fantastic four day experience. And it runs in parallel with the Hay Book Festival. Now, the one bit of advice, if you come, by the way, is do not bring a Kindle, because if you bring a Kindle to Hay on Wise, somebody will smash it. Uh, this has more books per head of population than any other town in the world, and they believe in real books. And I'm very sympathetic with that. Right? Um, so the cracks which are opening up in, our, in the stability of our world are opening up new possibilities. And I think the real issue is how do we engage with those new possibilities in a different way? Right? And that's where I'm much more interested in material reality, hence the concept of materialism, realism, rather than anything else. And also in the way that we start to engage in discourse. So one of the big things you see in the metamodern thing is the argument, and I think they get this wrong, I think they really don't understand Hegel, they suggest that postmodernism states that dialectic is the opposition of two things which has to be resolved. Now, that isn't quite what Hegel says, actually, but you know, we can leave that for the moment. Um, but really, and, and the, the whole systems thinking concept of di dialectics is also problematic because it assumes things can be resolved through conversation or attitude. Yeah? A lot of our work, and I can go into this later, is to put people into positions where they have to behave differently. Uh, this is a type of apparatic approach. Yeah? Uh, you don't try and say you need to believe this or you need to think differently. You place people into positions where they have to think things differently yeah, or they have to act differently. And that that's kind of like our general approach. And we've got a whole body of methods around that. Um, and that also brings in the whole concept of abduction. And I think metamodernism is poor on that. I mean, there, there are three kind of like basic approaches to abduction that I can see. One is the classic, which is from Peirce, which sees it as hypothesis generation. Um, Nora and I are having lots of conversations about this, by the way, and there's some videos on it. Nora sees it as the way in which you look at one, you see something different from the perspective of something old. 
Uh, and we see it much more as the way in which you create exaptive moments through abstraction. Yeah, and this comes from the sort of biological evolution that art comes before language and human, human evolution. Abstraction allows us to see things in different ways so we can make novel connections. But we don't make the mistake of then ignoring the reality and thinking that the abstractions are all that there is, which is a feature of, of some postmodernism. So that concept about using the, the cracks which are opening up by getting people to act in different ways is key. I was on a call to one of the big development banks this morning, basically talking about how you will not change attitudes to global warming until you get people to see global warming as a hyper-local real problem in sufficient volume that they will accept the political sacrifices necessary to see it at a, at a, at a mass level. So the last thing we need at the moment is people getting together to think differently about the world. We need people getting together in smaller groups to act in order to make the, a different type of world possible. And I can justify that more later, but that's key. And that links in with something I've quoted before, which is Terry Eagleton's book, Hope Without Optimism. Again, one of the positive aspects of metamodernism is it says we should assume that there is a way forward. We shouldn't just give up. It's not existential despair. Um, and I think hope without optimism is actually a better way of, of sort of thinking about that in terms of the way it works. And the big new thing we're working on at the moment, which has taken off with great surprise, actually, and I normally put out new frameworks and expect it to be about three years. This one's in three months has gone further than Kinevin did in 10 years, um, which is where we take and construct a theory in physics. If anybody knows Deutsch's work on this. Um, and we've actually moved that with constraint mapping to something called estroy mapping. So what we do is we map, we basically gather all of the constraints which are in play. And remember, constraints can be positive as well as negative. They can enable as well as contain. Uh, we then map those constraints onto a grid which goes energy cost of change against time to change. And then anything which is far right, and we draw that boundary, is something which is a given. It's not going to be changed. So we have to work with that as a, as a, as a constraint. And then we identify clusters of constraints, which can be attractors or boundaries or constructors or, or attractors, boundaries or constructors. And we identify how we could lower the energy cost of change or shorten the time to change and end up with multiple micro actions to achieve those results. Because what we're trying to do is to change the dispositional state so that good things are more likely to happen and bad things are less likely to happen. Or as I summarized it several times, if we can make the energy cost of virtue lower than the energy cost of sin, we've got a chance of making progress. Now, I think that sort of very material approach to change is far more significant with far more opportunities and can engage far more people and it also links in with this fundamental theory of change we developed, which is you ask people, how can you create more stories like these and fewer stories like those, which can engage anybody, but it doesn't have the elitist language, um, which you actually see in metamodernism. And yes, it is quite Taoist. I mean, most people in complexity will recognize the value of the Tao. Um, but I'll, I'll just make a comment here and I'm going to finish now. Um, the reason Chinese society has been stable for many years is actually the interaction of Taoism and Confucianism. It's the interaction of both which makes it stable. It's not Taoism on its own. And the sort of final point I'll make on this, all right, is, and again, it's this concern. When things start to go wrong in society, we get millennialist, you know, Radnorokian type religious movements. Yeah. And I think metamodernism is becoming one of those. So it's a way of escaping the reality with engaging with the world. So as a literary criticism technique, great in terms of its current manifestations. At best, it's a distraction. At worst, it's actually pretty negative. So at that point, I managed to talk for, I only thought I'd make 20 minutes. I've made 40 minutes. So that's that's longer than I expected, right? Really open for discussion. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Dave. Uh, we got some good questions in the chat already. If you have any questions, pop them in. Um, I'll warm up uh, the room with a question or two. So 
Uh, the three people that you you mentioned, uh, Daniel Gertz, John Verveke, and Brandon uh, Graham Dempsey, um, if you were to advise them, assuming you think they are well-meaning enough to consider your advice, how do you see they can course correct? And is there anything in particular you would suggest uh, to them? I think Brandon should probably go and read Karl Rahner and some liberation theologians like Guterresi, and then he might find a different way forward, all right? But that's my private prejudice as a former liberation theologian. Um, coming through, um, and I think I, don't, I think Vivaki has moved into the cult movement. There's a, there's a brilliant BBC series, by the way, which on radio, which came out, um, which is still available on BBC Radio Online, which looked at how cults grow. And actually, one of those specifically deals with rabble wisdom. If I could interview Dave Fuller in his disillusionment with Peterson. And I think that's worth listening to because that you, you, you can't afford to become a cult. So if you look at Brendan's video, it has, I mean, I, you can look online because I've, I've been directing the criticism. Um, a, he's speaking through a, a, a nice little avatar, which looks absolutely wonderful and surrounded by this wonderful, you know, magical realist environment full of, you know, Mexican women organizing food in plentiful forms on wooden tables in forest areas, all right? And you see the same sort of thing in Gay B, it's almost the same style. And yeah, you know, that, that's a classic approach, right? You, you basically say to people, you know, 80% of you depressed, wouldn't it be wonderful if light was like this? It's kind of like, you know, heaven on earth, right? So here is heaven. And sorry, I'm, I'm deliberately gonna get very controversial. Um, he, he then goes on to say that, I think all the all Protestants believe in the rapture, or eighty percent of them do. But it turns out that's only American Protestants on one survey, which is a bit extreme, right? Um, but it's almost like metamodernism is proposing its own rapture. Yeah. So I, I, if I were him, I would avoid that. Vivaki, I think, is lost. I think he's gone on the guru circuit. That's where he is. Uh, the minute you think everybody wants to listen to 15 hours of you where you don't say anything but you just throw lots of little facts in place in different combinations and hope that as a result of that people will accept whatever you say although he doesn't say anything about what you should do that's a classic cult type framework and um my follow-up is that uh, all three of those uh, individuals uh, daniel uh, John and, and Brendan were past guests at the STOA, um, and if they were to listen to this uh, and they uh, are open to have a conversation with you to receive this criticism directly, uh, would you be open to have a conversation with them? I'm not so much criticizing Daniel. I mean, I've stayed at Daniel's house. I've had long conversations with him and Forrest and Jordan and happy to re-engage re those, right? Um, and I think his analytical work is really good. So those three I'm, I'm quite comfortable with. I think they're just getting into some bad spaces on this. And yeah, happy to talk with Brenda. All right. So I have some... expected him to pop up because he was aware of it. But... So some scintillating uh, follow-up uh, uh, sessions at the store may emerge from this. Um, but uh, we'll pivot to Q&A. Uh, again, uh, keep your question concise and just one follow-up because we have a lot of questions. And we'll go with blah, 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 blah. Uh, Christopher, you had a question on stage theory. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> hey, Dave. Um, so here, I'll just read my question as I wrote it and maybe, maybe add a little bit to it. Um, so regarding stage theory, so maybe none of the existing frameworks are sufficiently precisely accurate. They don't necessarily capture everything. Um, <clears throat> it's not clear if you're suggesting that they're not even directionally, coarsely accurate. Um, you sort of indirectly did agree with it saying, you know, I'm incorporating Keegan's work, but at a lower level, you're sort of remixing it or something. But um, just to kind of make it clear, um, like, are you suggesting, for example, that like the characteristics that identify a Keegan stage five could be inhabited as the primary mode in like the sustained way by the typical 18 year old? In a certain context, possibly they could actually. Um, I mean, I have been asking people in stage theory and vertical development theory and horizontal development theory, and there'll probably be, you know, orthogonal development theory coming out soon because people might be able to sell for it, sell it. Can they give me any single evidence from the natural science to support the concept that adults go through those sort of phases? And they can't. 
all they can do is show their own work based on their own theory. So they start with a hypothesis and then they test it and correlate it. That's bad science, right? So I would expect to see something. Having said that, social science always has explanatory effects. So, you know, I mean, and you've got to be careful. You remember Piaget does his work on his own children, for God's sake. And it's like spiral dynamics is based on an extrapolation from Midwest American students. Yeah. You know, and, you know, L Lewin develops his whole leadership theory based on a study of 11 year old American males. I don't want to have leadership based on that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I think what we can say, and Piaget has insight, right? Nobody's going to challenge that. And he is writing in his time, of his time, at that time. So I think we take that insight and we say all of these represent aspects of human behavior, which may have use, which is how we use them as modulators. Yeah. So we, we say they're not linear, but they may represent characteristics of behavior which we can observe. And we can start to look at in which context they're relevant or not relevant or in which combination but it's not a linear process, right? So there is not a right linear process to discover. It's not a valid concept. And if I, all the science I've got basically says, you know, up, at, up until puberty, you don't see any racial prejudice in kids, except sort of in mimicking adult language, right? After puberty, it starts to set in. Um, early twenties, male, late twenties, female, um, the brain starts to lock down based on the prejudices of its tribe, and then it opens up again late 40s, 50s, right? So we do know that's a change, right? And we can see an evolutionary reason for that because, you know, you've, you've got to start adopting, you've had the, the longest period for education of any mammal, you've got to start adopting the prejudices of the tribe, and the reason it happens in women earlier is they have to work harder earlier, so men get another five or six years, yeah? Um, and then if you survive into your 40s or 50s, you've obviously got something about you, but you can't lead the tribe anymore. So you go into the wisdom business, something I'm actively working on, right? It's one of the ways you survive in old age because people want it. Now, we know that, all right? And we can work with that fact. But the reality is, all of we don't go through those five stages. It's not that X percent of the population reach it. And it completely ignores context. It's locked into this fundamental mistaken idea, which goes back to Jung and to Freud and to all of these sort of things, that we are pre-born with certain characteristics and we have to go through specific stages. Human beings generally evolve to make decisions in collectives, not as individuals. And we can actually exhibit Keegan stage five in small collective groups very quickly at very young ages. And the framing is the wrong framing. Hence my suggestion, we break it up, go to low level, think of them as modulators, don't think of them as stages. And then you stop privileging one over the other. I guess my, it seems like, yeah, the, 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 the crux hinge point here for, for me and um, is the, the emphasis on it's not linear and like like everything you said like i don't disagree with what you're saying but it feels like it's also then denying the clear reality of um like there's a progression there is a progression that you could like look across all populations and see that you are more capable typically generally say the older you get typical on along a number of dimensions and like if you understand that about people let's say then you can like act better in the world. You can act better, engage with reality better, maybe. So I don't accept that. I, th I think it's far more contextual than that. And I've yet to see any scientific evidence to support it. But what I've seen is people who have a concept of, of adult development go and actually study things, interview people, and then put their models in place. All right. Um, and I'll come back to this issue collective the individual. If we, we evolve to make decisions, and this is biological scaffolding, in, in extended family groups and clans, yeah, that's actually the primary unit of identity for humans. And those are capable of many different things which individuals aren't capable of. And that's actually where we sit. So I, I think it's completely the right, it's, it's, it's my point about Protestantism. It's a framing of the problem in terms of the individual as the primary actor. When we need to think of the individual just simply as part of a complex matrix of people in the environment in which different things are characteristics and emerge. Thanks. Interesting take. Pre appreciate the thoughts. All right. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, Matthew, you had a 
question on eugenics. Yes, uh, my question was in regards to um, the the connection. What connection specifically is there between developmental theory and eugenics? And in what sense of the word eugenics? Is there a like a background um, that I'm not aware of? Um, you could do if you actually look at the um, the tape that video recorded with Grotz or whatever his name is. All right, she. The first 10, 15 minutes of that is a brilliant summary from Nora, because remember, you know, she's now talking about her father and a grandfather in this context. So she summarizes that far better than I can. Right. The, the point is that the minute you have a linear progression with heightened states of enlightenment, then you also start to associate it with effectively trying to breed for that. Right. I mean, mm. I mean, if, if you look at the history of Scandinavia, there is a rather dangerous eugenic past which goes through to the 50s or 60s. Yeah. Which makes me worried when we get into Nordic versions of meta 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 modernism. So the, the danger is the minute you actually assume that one stage is higher than the other. Yeah, that's problematic. Now, coming back to some of Christopher's point, right? It's kind of like, you know, we, we know, for example, that, you know, if you want to be a mathematician, your best stuff is done before you're 25. In the humanities, we tend to do better stuff when we're older because it's more about integration, right? So all of these things are far more complex and messy um, than we should think about. So when you define a linear stage, people want to reach the heightened stage. Yeah, and spiral dynamics is the worst example of that. I mean, it's a complete and utter nonsense and pseudoscience. And you can tell that because, you know, when, when Wilbur adopted it, he created a new level called turquoise, which only people like him would aspire to. And then, you know, after that, you know, turquoise isn't good enough, so we get teal. I mean, it's only a matter of time before we run out of colours as new people come into play on this, all right? And it's the wrong way of thinking about it. And it's also this dismissal. I mean, you can see the same thing with meta rationality, which I was, I mean, I, I said the other day, I just banned the meta word. And I've had this with some people in sense making. They they put this stuff up about sense making, which is a wonderful set of platitudes. It sounds wonderful. You say, okay, so how do you achieve that? And they say, oh, I can't tell you. And they refuse to describe a method or an approach. They just say you have to experience it and then magically you will acquire meta rationality. Now that's the language of cults. So do you think inevitably it's going to turn into why are so few people in the world at key and stage five? Well, it must be look at the area of the world they come from. Therefore, we must like genetically breed different races. You think that's where it's inevitably going to devolve into? Well, you can see some of that. I mean, you can see heavy if you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley with the attempt. I mean, you 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 know, you've got Silicon Valley millionaires doing the Victorian equivalent of drinking virgin's blood to live forever. And going in for a whole body of stuff on matter augmentation. So what they want to do is they want to engineer themselves into the elite, right? And I say that sort of stuff is quite dangerous. And there's a lot of that if if you look at it in the literature. Yeah. I mean, the good news is that, um, and and to be honest, all right, if you can really afford it now, there's things to reverse cell maturation and everything else. All right, if we get rid of death in society, we've got a real problem. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I think there's some quite dangerous stuff going on in that. Um, the, the good news is that if you genuinely believe in um, uh, in that, what's it called? The point where humans and AI will cross over and you can transfer yourself to a machine. Yeah, the singularity. Yeah. If you yeah, genuinely believe in the singularity, then you basically ossified your brain to the point where for you it may be possible. This has been an incredibly helpful talk and cleared up a lot of my confusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, oh, I so love the translucent stage. I think I'm going to go for that. I have a course coming up on it, so uh, stay tuned. Um, <laughs> uh, Sarah, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, my question was about what you think uh, about the regeneration movement and kind of way to get back to territories and uh, to connecting again with nature. Sorry, I can hardly hear you. So could you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Um, my question was about your views on the regeneration movement. 
So what, what is your opinion of the regeneration of movement? That was the question. Don't really know enough, to be honest, to make any comment. I think you'd have to tell me more. I mean, if I've now got to go and watch another 16 hours of videos of people and get upset, I will never forgive you, but I'll happily do it if you can give me some references. Uh, so Sarah, perhaps you can put some uh, references in the chat uh, due to your audio uh, issues. Um, so we'll go to Jim. Jim, you had a, a question or a share. Jim Jones. Would you like to unmute, uh, Jim? Oh, yeah. Um, hi, Dave. Um, I had a really interesting discussion with a couple of people yesterday on, on the Beamer Optimism podcast that we recorded about narratives. And I love this um, Frozen 2 strategy um, idea. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak really to the um, to the relationship between narratives and, and ideology. It seems to me that um, the the narratives, in, in in the sense of the verb, are something that that's something that's very um, ongoing and dialogic in nature. But after a while, these the the narratives that emerge from the narrative process start to ossify into ideology. And I'm just wondering, how can we keep the uh, narrative process alive and ongoing without it kind of ossifying into, into ideology, which seems to run most of our thinking and, and certainly a lot of our policy frameworks? OK, I, I, I'm making up from point. There's nothing wrong with ideology. You can't really afford it. You can't really avoid it. I mean, some ideologies are wrong. Some are more likely to be right. Right. Um, I think that this is where we get into new materialism, particularly Deleuze, and I'm going to combine Deleuze now with some of Alicia's work on constraints, right? is what you actually see is, as people tell stories, and the internet is focusing these more, the internet does, there's a metamodern theory that the internet means we continuously encounter strangers, and that's actually basically wrong. What the internet does is we continuously get clustered in groups of people who think just like us. And that, that's a very different statement, right? And what actually happens is you get these patterns of my, and then we're talking about micro narratives, not grand narratives, lots of small little fragments. And they start to cluster like with like. And then they start to create what are called attractor wells, all right? It's very difficult to escape from them because you fall into them, right? Um, and these can be relatively harmless, all right? So, we have a major debate in Wales at the moment about whether you're allowed to play Delilah or not at the rugby match tomorrow. And I'm going to be heavily into major anti-English mode for the next eight weeks because it's the rugby season. And the one thing which matters is beating those buggers. All right. So, yeah, all of these sort of things are relatively harmless in the way, but then they get more serious around Trump. I mean, I had to read Trump's tweets every morning for four years until he was blocked. And then have to suffer withdrawal symptoms from righteous indignation, having sort of read them and got up and talked with people at MIT in the afternoon. All right. But what Trump was brilliant at was triggering these. I famously said a trope is a strange attractor is an assemblage. Yeah. So what that does is it creates a pattern which we sometimes call ideology. And that's an assemblage which is difficult to escape. Remember, I said agency affordance assemblage. We then get into this concept about lines of flight. So how do you escape it? And that's where we started to develop more stories like this, fewer stories like that. Because that way you can engage people in empathetic change. Right? More stories like this, fewer stories like that engenders empathy just by the way you phrase the problem. Whereas if you say to people, we need to be more open to diversity, you'll just get into negative stuff and people will talk about woke and stuff like that in terms of the way it works. So I think that this is a different way of thinking about the problem, right? And I think that's where, you know, this whole concept of complexity, the move to the move effectively to commutarianism from atomism, you know, all of these sort of things are coming together to give us actually very interesting new ways in which we can change things mm. and which recognize the reality of life. You can't change a narrative. But you can escape from narr from narrative patterns and you can't you can create multiple micro changes in narratives which basically break the assembly structures and allow new patterns to form. 
And that's where we're talking about this concept of micro sacrifice around climate change. Mm. Until you get sufficient micro sacrifices at a local level, the dispositional state is not such that people will vote for politicians who will make macro sacrifices. Mm. So in a sense, the Paris Accord is exactly the wrong way to go because it discharges responsibility to somebody else and it doesn't respect the reality. Mm, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. I mean, just to add in on that, it's, it's my problem with the in, inner development goals, which I think are a major distraction and a dangerous distraction with Otto Scharmiger's theory, you with Peter Senge, is all of them are neo-colonialist because they're trying to define a future based on a very specific culture yeah. and a very specific enlightenment framing of history. Yeah. Right? Now, if I was going to say my alternative to the metamodern stuff from then is just think about Renaissance, not enlightenment and go to a wonderful Italian philosopher called Vico, who at the time of the Enlightenment said, we shouldn't abandon, yeah, there's wonderful new stuff, but the old stuff has value as well, mm. right? And I think actually, to be honest, I mean, the conversations I was with Lena in, in Copenhagen, that's where she is as well, but she's just coming from a different perspective on it. May, may I sneak in an, another quick question? Uh, just, I was wondering, you're talking about crisis of meaning, but what do you what do you think about the idea of crisis of perception in the sense that that actually the way we perceive the world since the Enlightenment has been very reductionist, you know, following people like Capra and Eisenstein, you know, and now we need to be much more, much more holistic in our perception. And um, I ban the holistic word. I think it's really dangerous. OK, maybe not holistic, but maybe um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of McGilchrist sense, that kind of... Um... Oh, God, no, please don't get me onto McGilchrist. <laughs> then you're into more pseudoscience and the whole left-right brain nonsense, all right, which is just nonsense. Right? You think? OK. I don't only think. I mean, you can go to the scientific evidence. Yeah, you know, things can things can move between it. You're talking about autonomic novelty receptive processing. There isn't an emotional, rational stuff. I mean, even McGilchrist is kind of like trying to say we shouldn't take him too literally because he's getting too much problem. But there's so much ma you know, money invested in master and the emissary, he can't back off completely, all right? <laughs> okay. um, sorry, I shouldn't get you, you're picking a favorite. I, I was meant to be on a panel yeah, with McGilchrist the other day and he didn't turn up, so I was still disappointed in that one. Oh, I'd like to see that conversation. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it is, I mean, we, we, I can see where it came from. I read Master and Emissary when it came out and I can see it. Just the yeah. science has moved on, all right? Yeah. And we know that isn't the case. It's, it's actually quite different in very interesting ways. So if you look at Freeman's work and the way that there are chemicals which decompose neurological receptors, so we never remember anything the same way twice. And that has evolutionary advantage because it forces novelty into the system. So these crude dichotomies and the, the problem is, and this is my point about Neoplatonism, it is encourages Manichaeism. There's one, there are these two things and this one is better than that one. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing builds into that. You know, the famous statement is that St. Paul took the worst of Christianity and Augustine took the worst of St. Paul and Calvin took the worst of Augustine. And I'll, I'll sort of yeah. stand by that one. Right? This is for the theologians amongst you. So I think that the key thing on the assembly structure is to start to recognize that it, it isn't it isn't something rational in that sense, and neither is it reductionist. That's a very northern European, North American concept. Mm. What you've got is a strange attractor, and that's one of the best named phenomena, because nothing quite follows the same path, but there's a there's a pattern which actually gives you predictive cap capability. So that's why we talk of that's why we would say assemblage is a strange attractor. And therefore it's capable of disruption. And one of the other big differences, by the way, between systems thinking and complexity science is that systems thinking defines systems as having boundaries, whereas complexity says systems don't have to have boundaries. And that's actually really yeah. important mm -hmm. because if things don't have boundaries, the escape mechanisms are very different. You can change the coalescent pattern, which is what we're doing with more like this, fewer like that. So I think, and as you know, we take natural science, we apply it to social systems. We don't start with a study of social yeah. phenomena because you can never get enough data. We start with natural science, then we develop the methods over four or five years from that. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep coming back to that agency, assemblage, affordance. Mm -hmm. If you start to describe issues through those three lenses, 
you're describing them in a way in which you can do something about the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's been great. Thanks. I, I won't take up any more of your time. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, Madalena, you had a question. Let me roll up because I want to. I, I want. I don't want to misquote. Um, well, in an interview <clears throat> with David Lipset in '72, Gregory Bateson was very blunt. He said the most one could do for the world was scientific work, which might reconcile Occidentals to death, mm -hmm. the ultimate surrender of control. Just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, and I, I think there is a sort of we should just resign ourselves to the fact that we're going to lose our environment in you know one or two generations. I, I actually, and I wouldn't do that. That, but this is partly the Catholic in me speaking. All right, is that to, to give up hope is a is a mortal sin. Doesn't mean you have to be oh, optimistic, but you shouldn't give up I, hope. I didn't read it that way. I okay. read it. I read it more from the standpoint that you're not betting on afterlives, whether it's after oh, no. meta. <laughs> no, I buy that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I think, I mean, the thing about Bateson is, and I wish people would stop call, calling him a cybernetician because he's nothing to do with modern cybernetics. All right. I mean, it's just completely different. Um, we, we, and it's, I think and Nora's talking a lot about this, and we talked about this with Tyson. It's this concept of a peace and reconciliation process with our environment, and that is going to have to be scientifically defined. So, yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, and especially after a pandemic, I would think that that kind of awareness could be a strange well, attractor. <laughs> well, it's not just that. I mean, I, I famously said God, you know, COVID was God's gift to humanity because it was a controllable wake up call. That's not the worst pandemic we'll see in my lifetime, and I'm 69 in a month's time. I mean, there are bacteria thawing out in the Siberian tundra to which we got no natural resistance and no antibiotics. And bacterial plague is far worse than virus plague if you look at human history. So we desperately need science and awareness and support of science, and which is why it's such a despair to see what's happening in the States to, to illustrate this, and this is a few years ago. I was working with the Ebola management teams down in Dallas. And Ebola is going through this really dangerous point, which viruses go through, where they start to migrate to being symbiotes. And that's when they stop killing everybody, which means they transfer much faster. And I was told I couldn't talk about evolution because it was a controversial theory. And this is with the Ebola management teams. Now, that, and if you look at what De Santos is doing on education in Florida, it's it's almost like there's this death wish in the dominant economy of the world, which is, and I, I would say I can understand a lot of metamodernism because it is very, very US centric. Yeah, if you look at most of the literature, it's terribly US centric. Thank you. All right. Um... Alex Booth, uh, you said you had no video, but is your audio working? If not, I'll read your question. Um, okay, here's uh, uh, Alex's question. For an individual to stay poised within a collective affordance landscape, does this imply a self-imposed limitation on the length of time out from the now that one attempts to make predictions about or allows themselves to take their imagination seriously? Uh, I think that's an overemphasis on the individual. It's more the interaction between communities, which matters. I think the other thing is that certainly our focus at the moment is it's more important to accurately describe the present than to make statements about the future. Because if you can accurately describe the present, you can identify pathways which you can start to pursue, which might lead to a more interesting possibility downstream. So I, I may not have got the question, but I, I wouldn't phrase the problem in that way. It seems to be very much focused on individual, individual consciousness and individual choice. And I'm saying that though individuals matter, 
um, the constraints, the enabling constraints of the, you know, this is the Knevin concept, the, the multiple histories of their past, the realities of the present, the affordances provide, all of those make the thing far more complex, yeah, in terms of the way we, we should frame the problem and frame possible solutions. All right. Um... Looks like that was all the questions. If you have, there's a lot of shares. Um, so I recommend you save the chat before you leave. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to disagree with Professor Peanut here. <laughs> I mean, he's he's, he's in, using humility as a, as a rhetorical weapon of arrogance. Yeah, he'll agree with anything. I mean, that, that's what he does if you listen to it. I mean, I've studied rhetoric, all right? And he's obviously done the same thing. It's pretty self-evident. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, you have your hand up. Um, I don't, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Yep. Yep, I know. Right. Thank you so much, Dave. I was wondering, um, as we are talking in English and coming back to the linguistic approach, hmm. if you know anything about another impact like Slavic languages like Confucius, Asiatic, because it seems like all the idea of complexity was given in my childhood and the whole soci the socialization. And then I came to Germany 20 years ago. It was like, simplify your life. There is no complexity. Linearity is given. And I was so happy to find you from years ago, <laughs> um, where the complexity was a kind of reborn. And I need to fight for it. So do you know anything different? Because we have it like given. And it seems I, th I think, yeah. yeah, language definitely matters. I mean, I mean, I don't speak Finnish, but the whole Finnish national epic is, and I've read it in translation, and stayed in the hotel, which tells the story as you go through it. If you ever go to Helsinki, that's a wonderful hotel to tell it, yeah? Is, I think if you move into Finland, less so in Sweden, to some extent, northern Norway, yeah, the language actually supports complexity, yeah? Um, it's no coincidence that the English don't have the equivalent to the Welsh Kinevin or Hirio, yeah? Because those concepts are commutarian concepts, which you don't see in Anglo-Saxon languages. Yeah. And German sort of feeds off that. Although if you get into Schweizer Joyce, my, my mother, who spoke it reasonably fluently, you know, she went to university in Germany in 1948, which was quite brave and had to wear a passport around her neck so she wouldn't get raped by British and American soldiers. But she always said if you move into Bav Bavarian versions of German, yeah, it's far more collective in the way it describes the situation than if you move into Prussian versions of German, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But Lang, I mean, Heidegger famously said, man thinks he's the master of language, but language is the master of man. Yeah, yeah that, that language has a fundamental impact on the way we describe problems and the way we think about the world. Even if you don't have a huge vocabulary, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. So if I may ask back, because it's the interconnectivity between the language, but also the idea of singularity, like by Rekvitz. So it's a bit a different one than the one you described, where we just know it's not about us anymore in this global interconnected place, but about the individuals which are over empathized. And the, the idea of languages, of maybe bilinguality or multilinguality, I just wonder where it could be a place to introduce them even more. I think, first of all, I don't think it ever has been about us. I think it's always been about us in combination with other people anyway. I think that's, you know, even, even when, I mean, the American Constitution, to my mind, was written at exactly the wrong period in political philosophy, all right? And it's all, all the problems come from that in terms of its assumptions. So I think we've always, to some extent, been collective. But I think it's also the way that language develops. So families have language, Yeah. You know? So, for example, if you're in my family and I invite you for a Sunday afternoon stroll, yeah, you'll probably equip yourself for three nights overnight under survival conditions, because that references a time when I did lead the family on a Sunday afternoon stroll. And shall we just say that it got a bit difficult? So, yeah, la language isn't, and th this is the big, you know, the major one of the major problems with AI, right, is that it doesn't understand the social context and the history, yeah. Um, around the way language evolves and tone, right? I mean, massive problem with digitalization at the moment is we can write down about five to eight percent of what we know, and we're forgetting everything else. 
So we're dumbing ourselves down to the level at which digitization will work. And that's really dangerous. Yeah, human beings use metaphor. You know, they use references to common language. Um, I was with one of my staff in Copenhagen the other day, and I said, you're just like bloody rabbit. And she knew just what I was talking about. Because it was a reference to rabbits, friends and relationships in Winnie the Pooh. But it's only because we share that context we can use language in that way. And that's a fundamental feature of human beings in terms of the way we work. Yeah? And we neglect that. And I think the problem with, sorry, you're getting me onto favorite rants at the moment. If you look at what's happening in Australia and the UK at the moment, it's very dangerous because if you want to study engineering, you will actually have pay very low fees. If you want to stand and study the humanities, your fees will go through the roof. Yeah? Now, what that actually means is education in understanding people and government is being confined to the elite who can pay for it, which is what happened in the 19th and 18th centuries. And that is developing. And that's, that's one of the things we need to fight. Thank you. Um, so this might be... Oh, I love that from Rob Knight. Yeah, you're, you're quite good. I'm that. Sorry. You're right. Yeah. Um, so, so let me see this. Is this a question, uh, Chris? Do you want to ask us on stoicism? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I've I've heard the criticism of stoicism before. Um, listening to like the podcast and stuff like that, but I always wanted to like dig into the details of, um, like where the criticism comes from, because when what I've read and heard it, it to me it says do the next right thing like you said the frozen two um so if that that's where I'm seeing it I'm wondering what your criticism of it is well, you have to remember that from my point of view I think Diogenes had it right okay um and Diogenes you know telling Alexander to get out of his life I think is one of my heroic moments for philosophy right um, I'm a cynic. I'm, if I find anything, I'm a cynic, not a stoic. All right. I think I would agree if you actually go back to stoical writings, you can actually make it support that. But the practice is, if you look at something like Marcus Aurelius, yeah, it's a symphony to to content yourself with living the life and the power. That's actually the effect of it. All right. And I come from a philosophical school which looks at the impact of what people think rather than the sort of technical analysis of what they intended by it. Yeah. So that's my criticism, right? In reality, you see stoicism in that context. Now, yeah, we can get into the, the details of it and it can mean the right, next right thing, but it often means the next right thing within the confines of power. It's, it's a philosophy of acceptance, not a philosophy of rebellion. Any follow up? And I'm still a Catholic Marxist and <laughs> think it's hard if I come back to it. Right? I think I'll leave it at uh, fair enough. Uh, it probably could be a, a whole discussion of itself. But um, yeah, I just uh, that gives me something to read. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, so if anyone has any last question, feel free to pop it in. We can sneak maybe one more in. Um, Benita Roy, wondering if Dave has some relationship to the notion of Tao Sage. Benita, would you like to pop off mute and uh, elaborate? Hi, Dave. Hi, Benita. Good to see you. Still, so still the got question, a, a wishbone somewhere on the on the shelf behind me somewhere. Yeah. The what? I still got that bone you gave oh, me. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh great! I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, I enjoy the joy thing about it. Um, I asked my question because first of all, this is a great session, and it's nice to see you ranting. <laughs> Um, you know, there's this thing happening, I'm kind of parent adjacent to it, and I, I just wrote a, I just wrote a piece, I'm, I'm writing a series called uh, Before Socrates, because I was in a retreat with John Verveke, and I, I challenged him that I thought Socrates was more harm than benefit, um, and I just wrote a piece that is talking about iatrogenic, iatrogenic yeah. um, spirituality. Um, and 
So that's been on my mind while I'm listening to you. But there's this whole like big move to uh, do these ecologies of wisdom practices. And for me, like when I think of that, I'm very Taoist and I think of Taoist sages. And I was just wondering if you had any uh, yarns or stories or any relationship to um, it's, you know, it's basically a, almost a myth. Um, I, and anyways, that's what I was just wondering. Think, first of all, I think, I mean, most people in complexity are interested in the pre-Socratics uh, because of the concept of flow. I think some people go too far and, and elevate it too high. All right. But the pre-Socratics are interested and you can make a lot of parallels between them and Taoism. Um, and to be honest, I think it's quite fascinating. I mean, in the history of religion, Taoism goes west and then becomes Buddhism and then comes back. Yeah, so, and then it goes further west and it becomes what I call faux Buddhism, which is what you see in the US. I mean, the US version of Buddhism is very much about the individual, which is not what real... None of them would survive two years in a in a monastery in that sense, right? So I think Taoism is really interesting. I think you can find exactly the same in a huge amount of the Catholic tradition. People forget that. Yeah. It's fashionable to look east, but if you look at Karana, if you look at Teadashada, if you look at the whole um the whole shift of Heidegger's concepts into Catholic theology, which comes with Rana, that, that actually has got a huge amount of Taoism type elements in it. In fact, Rana had discourse with Taoism. So I think there are things in the Western tradition which do that as well. You don't have to go east for this sort of stuff in the way it works. And But I do think there's a general problem with mastery. And I think that's what my problem with faux Buddhism if it emphasizes mastery, it goes with the hierarchical stuff. It goes with a heightened state of awareness. It goes with adult development theory. It goes with spiral dynamics. It's all about mastery and subservient to the master. Yeah? And that for me is problematic. In, 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 it's not community based. And I think Taoism in terms of the whole concept of its use of heuristics is really powerful. And if you can actually, as we can do, so we can map the heuristics which are present in multiple micro narratives, that gives us a better way of understanding and changing in society than by aspirational future states. Yeah. So I think pre-Socratics are really interesting. I think they actually get picked up in a lot of modern philosophy as well, even if the attribution isn't direct. Um, but yeah, yeah. Any follow-up, uh, Nita? thumbs up uh all right so uh, i'll sneak in one last question um so we have uh there's i don't know if you you know this podcast decoding the gurus um dave uh, they had they came on the stoa and they talk about uh the secular guru archetype and they pattern match jordan peterson as it basically like what they argue people who do wisdom signaling amongst other things um that's coming from a place of narcissism uh and uh, so my curiosity is that a lot of these people that they would pattern match as a secular guru have a big following. Um, so if there's not, uh, and they're talking about wisdom or meaning, and if there's not like a meaning crisis, would you say there's just some kind of meaning hunger? Uh, if not, why do these people uh, attract such a, such a following? Okay, so when I grew up, and I will have a confession here, I was actually quite good at it in Wales. We used to have preaching competitions. Yeah, and... I mean, yeah, not only did we have preaching competitions, but if you couldn't preach extempore from the Bible for two hours without notes, without thinking of it in advance, you would never win. And we used to score people like they score, you know, like they score ice skaters, right? Now, this is a Welsh tradition, right? Now, the secret of doing that, and so I was trained in rhetoric, and this is what Varaki does all the time, is you give Bible quotes, you give a bit of science, you give a practical story, you just throw lots of things in place in multiple sequences that nobody can disagree with you. And then, oh my God, they fall down and worship. Right? That's the mechanism. So the secret is to use humility as a weapon, because if you're controversial, people can disagree with you. You string together platitudes and truisms so that nobody can disagree with you, which means they become a follower. And that is really dangerous, right? Um, I'm not sure that I, I mean, I think 
yeah, we, we could get into Lacan and Vuissance and the whole concept of pervert Vuissance and the way that links in with particularly male narcissism. But I think if you look at the, the recording between Pedersen and Varaki, that is narcissism amplified in terms of the way they do it. And what they're doing is it's it's basically massive word and concept dropping and reinforcement of each other. Oh, I think that too. Well, that's brilliant. Or have you seen this? And it, it, it is that preaching competition. It's dropped lots of things in to impress people, but don't actually weave it into a coherent pathway which can be criticized. Yeah? And when somebody weaves things into a coherent pathway, it can attract criticism. And generally, it won't be perceived as humble because it's going to say things people, some people don't want to hear. And uh, my follow-up there, uh, I remember Benita Roy, when she, one of the very early sessions of the Stoics, she said, well, we got to cut the epistemic fat in the, in, in the space, uh, kind of gesturing towards what you just said. Um, so people who, well-meaning people who are attracted uh, to thinkers or philosophers who, you know, have... Uh, all these mental models and you know word salads um what would you recommend some practices there to uh uh be wise uh when um listening to those uh this material i think maintain diversity but i mean this has always been the case i mean it's quite crazy to believe that some american discovered the future truth in tablets buried somewhere in america as the second arising of christ right but there's a whole religion based on it yeah so religions generally arise in times of stress i mean and i'm not a catholic all right i will defend that but not in the sense of and it was i mean the, the conversation we had with lena was really interesting because i'm a catholic convert and she's a convert to judaism yeah so she converted from lutheranism to judaism and i converted from atheism into catholicism right now, converts make deliberate choices, which is quite fascinating. So that conversation is a really interesting conversation because acknowledgement of a belief system rather than growing up into a belief system is very different. Yeah? And it also makes you more critical. And I think the danger is that if you do have people who are lost, then the person who says things they want to hear, that's what Trump did. Yeah, and I, I'll say this now, I might as well just go for broke. There's absolutely no difference between Trump and people like Varaki. What they're doing is they're attracting followers, right? Um, maybe more ethically, maybe less brutal. It's a different constituency they're going for. But fundamentally, that's what you get. Yeah. So sorry, to answer your question directly, we need an educational system which actually forces people to confront different things. I mean, I said this last time I was on the stove, but I'll repeat it. Uh, every week from the age of 11 to 18, I had to argue for something for seven minutes without notice, even if I disagreed with it. Yeah, in front of a class. Right. That made me hypercritical. Yeah, it was a process which made me critical and made me see things. All right. And it was hugely valuable training, by the way. And those of us who are good at it got formally taught rhetoric. Yeah, what you need is, and it's that one of the things we do, for example, we had an EU project where we actually create meaning walls in which you find stories told by other people, you interpret it, and then you're shown how they interpreted it, which forces you to look at the difference because you went through the same process, right? Now, that's the sort of intervention we need. It's micro interventions, which get people to see things from different perspectives. It's not admonitions from the latest guru to be a, an enlightened one. It's not an unacceptable slur. I'm not comparing it with Trump in terms of politics. I'm saying the rhetorical style is the same. Sorry, it is, if you actually study it. That doesn't mean I think he's an evil guy like Trump. Trump is evil, Barack isn't evil but I'm comparing the rhetorical style of the way they argue it. So please don't, please don't mistake yeah, a criticism of a style with an ad hominem, it isn't. How, how is John Verbeke's rhetorical style similar to Trump's? Because I know something about rhetoric and I know something about style. So please explain again how they have a similar style. Because what you get is a series of statements, each of which on its own seems rational to the audience it's targeted at. Take that as a qualification, right? That's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and they're basically thrown together. There's no actual underlying narrative or explanation mm. behind them. They're thrown together and they gradually, what they do is they activate an assemblage pattern. And then you start to fall into that and you start to ascribe authority to the person who's doing it. That's the mechanism. I know how to do it. I've done it myself. All right. Um, it's a style. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a technique of rhetoric. Right. Now, I don't think I think Trump is plain bloody dangerous. I think Baraki is largely irrelevant, to be honest, but he's going to attract a following. So I'm not making a comparison in terms of morality or anything else. Hmm. I'm basically making a comparison in terms of the way that fragments are used yeah to actually suck people into believing what you're saying have you ever read any of Vervecki's actual scholarship i've listened to half a dozen videos and i've read three of his papers okay yeah all right it would be great as others have said to, to actually see you in conversation with john Vervecki. it would be very interesting I think he has, I think, I think he has more substance than you think. And I don't think uh, he, yes, I can say he's trying to get a following, but I don't think his intent is as nefarious as you're implying. I, I didn't imply nefarious. I think, I mean, first of all, I think I would acknowledge he's he, building a cult. He's building. Yeah. He is building a cult, right? Whether he's doing it deliberately or whether it's accidental, I don't know. Right. Um, his scholarship in Neoplatonism is outstanding. I couldn't even compete with him on that front. All right. He's really good at that sort of very detailed stuff. Yeah. Um, I would have a lot more respect for him if he came out and condemned Peterson until he does that. That's his colleague, man. That's his colleague. Sorry. At the same academic. I couldn't care less that. Yeah. And, and, and both of them linked in with that right wing funded university. All right. If, if something is wrong and you don't condemn it, then you have a problem. And that's where I would have the respect for him. Yeah, he may or may not be a colleague. I've got colleagues. That, I mean, I'm doing the Michael Jackson lecture this year. I have fundamental disagreements with Michael Jackson. And I do it all the time. Yeah, you, you can disagree with colleagues. Right. Um, and you should do it. And if you think they're wrong, you should say so. Yeah, any final words, Greg? Maybe he doesn't think he's wrong. And I make my point. I stand by my point. Yeah. OK. All right. If he doesn't think he's wrong by reinforcing Peterson, that raises huge questions for me. Yeah, and this is this has been interesting because John John's a friend of mine, um, and I know he's uh, he's actually concerned about uh, being pattern matched as a guru. Um, so, and he I know he would be open, or I think he would be open to have a conversation with you. So, uh, uh, inviting you again, would you be interested to have a conversation with John yeah, if sure. he's willing? And I'll have a conversation with virtually anybody. Cool. Um, so that will bring uh, the end of our session today. Uh, Dave, uh, thank you uh, once again for coming. Uh, any parting words you'd like to leave us with here at the at the STOA? Just the response to criticism. In actual fact, if you map and represent narrative, you don't need any sophistication to answer more stories like this, fewer stories like that. Uh, we do it, for example, with transgenerational pairs, young people with older people answering that question, coming up with ideas and making change. So you may have an extreme sophistication of theory, but the practice doesn't need the theory to implement. All right. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, uh, Dave, for that uh, thought provoking session. Uh, it was well received. Uh, always a pleasure having you at the STOA. I'd love to have you back. Um, and I'll make some a few announcements in a moment. Um, but uh, if you have any, uh, put in the chat, you can check out other sessions at the, the STOA. Uh, and then we have an upcoming session, uh, post-authenticity, profilicity, and genuine pretending. And this profilicity thing uh, um, phrase is kind of related to some of the stuff that we touched on today. So you can check that out on uh, February 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so that being said, Dave, everyone, thanks so much for coming to the STOA today. Pleasure.